Today I'll be reading Why Humans Can't Cast, written by In Babylon They Wept. Kel Chirac had seen avatars before. They were godhood nestled inside mortal flesh, a star compressed inside an eggshell. Beautiful, but stillborn. After all, what fragile cage of flesh and bone could house divinity? What cage indeed? Even without the second sight, the man in front of him would have been an imposing figure. More than eight and a half heads tall, weathered and powerful with the strength of ages, the crown of men was borne upon his skull as if it were a mere bauble, and not a wart iron horror, half and again as heavy as any soldier's breastplate. Even a layman would recognise that there was something mythic to humanity's chosen ruler. But Kel Chirac was not just a layman, he was an Archmagus of Ostradon, the last living master of the Second Sight, and his eyes showed him so much more than just strength and power. They wove the dreaming and the waking into something more true than reality itself. And if the man was mythic within the waking, in the dreaming, he was impossible. He shone with uncaged divinity. It wasn't a star lodged within his chest, waiting to burn its way out. It lay over him like an armour, coiled around him in layers. One could barely recognise there was a man inside at all. He seemed lost inside his own grandeur, like a grain of sand inside a pearl. Kel Chirac almost didn't notice himself pushing his way through the crowd. The knowledge that this event was for politicals meant nothing to him. Less than nothing. To think he'd been brought here by the Dwarven Council to probe this man for weakness, to find a way to end the Age of Men. His mind's eye would blind before he found a chink in that armour. Even the sun itself would seem dull now. He was through the crowd now, just feet away from the God King. It always felt a little superior to his brethren for his disinterest in gold and silver, but here, in the dreaming, he was as lost in greed as any ancient dwarven king. He reached across the gap, hoping to run even a fingertip across the splendour before him. It wasn't until his hand was just a hair's breadth away that he had realised what he was doing might be foolish. He froze. He barely noticed the weapons of the honour guard swinging towards him. Those were formalities, every bit as decorative as the gems and silks and fineries that he had seen of lesser kings. If this being did not wish to be touched, no amount of steel would make it safer. The permission that he sought was not from them. It was from him, and he granted it. The blades froze in place, along with the crowds themselves. The king had carved a space in time, a sliver of space, to give audience to his newest subject. An honour not lost on one of the few mages who knew the specific impossibility of chronomancy. Cal Chirac had not felt awe like this in centuries. He regained some semblance of composure, felt the memory of the past trickle back to him, and remembered why his finger was just a hair's breadth away from the hem of the king's robes. "'May I?' he asked, embarrassed at his previous presumptuousness. "'No,' the king answered, not unkindly. "'You would not survive the contact.' There was a brief pause as Cal Shadak struggled to find something to say, something to ask. It wasn't a dearth of curiosity that brought the pause, but an overabundance. He had too many questions, and they had all tried to leave at the same time, getting stuck in his throat. One managed to break free from the jam. How do you survive it? A slight twitch of shining lips let him know that he'd asked a good question. I'm human. The dwarf raised a finger to disagree, catching itself before giving voice to the dissent. What kind of fool would he be? 
to claim that he knew more about godhood than the man wrapped in it. Instead, he tried to puzzle out the meaning of the answer. He had no success. Why does that matter? The king gestured to the frozen crowd and asked a question of his own. Do you know why humans can't cast? Kalshadak shook his head. He didn't bother to point out that the frozen moment in time was a contradiction to that particular claim. If there was ever such a thing as an explanation that proves the rule, it was standing before him, wrought in gold. No. The king didn't answer his question immediately. Instead, he reached out and laid a gentle hand atop the head of one of his subjects, a humble servant. There was no gentle transition, no gradual process. The man, still frozen in place, instantly transformed from flesh to a shining statue of molten gold. He let go, and the man instantly reverted back to being normal flesh and bone. Religions had sprouted from lesser miracles. The elves, they were, sealed off from magic. You just saw that's a lie. We are perfectly open to it. It flows through us and out us, and when it is done, only we remain. They are the ones sealed off. The power can flow in, but it cannot leave so easily. They cage it inside themselves, claim that it is their own. The tame fragments of glory they pull from the world's quiet places will tolerate such disrespect. But divinity is not so easily stolen. If it cannot find an exit, it will make one. The golden aura covering the king flared outwards, and Kel Chirac saw that its solid appearance was a convenient illusion. It was always a maelstrom of incandescent energy only sometimes compressed to foil thickness. He took an alarm step back as the cloud expanded more, aware that even a fragment of the shining storm would burn through him like a gut full of acid. Shall I tell you if it hurts? Shall I tell you the fate of the other three would-be spies of the Dwarven Council? You are unique in your gifts, but your death, the tornado of energy spread out further, the flecks of gold finally spaced far enough apart that the man in the middle could be seen. Uncut hair, weathered skin, and brown eyes gave no indications of a special destiny. Even the height and strength seemed too common for such a figure. Man had built many warrior kings over the centuries. It had only built one god. Cal Chirac's mad scramble back halted as he tripped over a cobblestone curb. Those simple brown eyes met his, every bit as steady as they'd been behind the golden carapace. He couldn't look away, even as he saw the whirling cloud of death inch closer to his feet. He couldn't tear his vision away from the man in the eye of the storm. Will be rather boring. There was a flash of flame as the swirling shards finally caught up with their target. A bystander, just inches away from the cowl, incinerated instantly, the ashes unable to even fall within the space of frozen time. The glittering cloud instantaneously compressed itself back to its foil-thin state, wrapped around the king as close as a second skin. Kel blinked. The king shrugged good-naturedly. The other three spies are waiting for you in the palace library. You should have more than enough information to lay both the curiosity and the ambitions of the dwarven lords to rest. If you play your cards right, you will die from nothing more exciting than the ravages of time. It took a moment to look pointedly at the frozen pillar of ash before continuing. The elves are going to lose as many assassins as it takes for their curiosity to overcome their fear. 
It will be an important milestone for them. I would request that you do not give them hints on how to pass this test, even if it would make these meetings much simpler. Kel nodded. It was all he could do. He was clever, but between the awe, fear, horror, and gratitude that he was struggling to process, he might as well have been a child. Uh, thank you. Time rushed back into play. Steel clanged into the space that Cal once stood. An L-shaped pile of ash became a room-shaped cloud of smoke, and a lone, frantic dwarf managed to bolt his way out of the gates before anyone realised he was gone. Without higher reasoning skills on the ready, Cal reverted to a simple task-centred list. Get to the library, get his friends, get back to the dwarven hills and tell the lords, beg the lords, convince the lords that the age of men was not something that could be fought. He spat absent-mindedly on the ground and had a morbid realisation of the stakes when he saw that the loogie was more grey than green. And that brings us to the end of today's story. If you enjoy the stories we narrate and want to keep listening in, be sure to hit the birds to subscribe.